for you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Dome here with the American Hip Institute. Uh, pleased to welcome Dr. Alex Tauchin, uh, who is our guest faculty lecturer here today with our fellowship, as well as our uh, research institute. Uh, Dr. Tauchin uh, attended medical school and residency at Loyola University and subsequently performed his fellowship in adult reconstruction at the Anderson Orthopedic Research Institute. And he's here to speak with us today about the Exeter experience and cemented total hip arthroplasty. Uh, over to you, Alex. Very good. I want to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dome, for the invitation to join you guys today. This is great. Obviously, new uh, new times, not being able to do this in person, but uh, appreciate you guys all being on the call on this uh, nice Friday afternoon. So we'll get started. So why Exeter and kind of what this talk is about. So when I was a resident at Loyola, which wasn't that long ago, I just finished my residency in 2016, I didn't have a whole lot of experience uh, with cementing total hips. Uh, Hemi is obviously a little bit more, but, but even so, not, not a whole lot of cementing experience. And during my fifth year, I knew that I had matched at the Anderson Clinic in Virginia. And I went there for a meeting before I actually started the fellowship. So this was April of my fifth year residency. And at the time, uh, that meeting, the, uh, the Rothman Renault Traveling Fellows were coming through. And the gentleman pictured here, uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew Wilson, or Mr. Matt Wilson, uh, as he's called, uh, was one of the traveling fellows at the time. And he is uh, one of the uh, consultants in Exeter. And his whole talk was about cemented total hips. And, you know, I kind of <laughs> realized at that time, I didn't have a whole lot of idea with, you know, a lot of details with what he was talking about, because I just never seen much of it. So it kind of sparked my interest a little bit. And during my fifth year residency, I was lucky enough to be awarded a, uh, a, a grant that was a traveling fellowship through my institution. And it was sort of a build your own adventure kind of thing. And that you would submit a proposal to really go anywhere in the entire world that you wanted to, as long as it would quote further your orthopedic knowledge. And they gave you a, a sum and you had to submit a budget and everything. And so I got in touch with Mr. Wilson here and he said, yeah, we have uh, visitors to Exeter all the time. Uh, we'd be happy to have you. And I was lucky enough to get that award. So uh, I was able to get it. And went to Exeter in uh, November of 2017, which is just a couple of months after I started uh, at North Shore, so it's uh, shortly into practice. Uh, Exeter is the birthplace of the Exeter hip stem. Um, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, have, have heard of this uh, probably, but maybe didn't realize that it was actually named after a city uh, where it was born. Um, and this was in the 1960s by Mr. Robin Ling and uh, Clive Lee, who was an engineer. And unless something has changed recently, I don't think it has. Uh, this is currently the most implanted hip stem in the entire world. Uh, since it's uh, been being used, I believe it's over 2 million uh, exiters have been implanted worldwide, it's, which is a little foreign to us because we really don't use it a whole lot in the U.S. Uh, it's a little hard for me to see everybody on the same screen since I got my thing shared, but anyone feel free to chime in. Does anyone have any experience using Exeter just right off the bat? Ben, maybe start with you. Is yeah, this a stem that you're... I'll speak right off the bat for myself. I, I really don't. Um, and obviously, I've heard about it my entire career, but um, I, I'm not certain I've ever even seen one. Excellent. And that, that's, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that. Obviously, there's someone with your experience to say that, you know, to, to have not seen what, what the rest of the world really uh, finds a lot of utility and is, uh, is interesting. How about you, AJ? Yeah, same. I mean, I think I was around the same timeline as you coming to the residency and, and most of what we did uh, was uh, press fit, uh, total hips, and, and truth be told, uh, none of the settings that I trained with uh, use this particular implant system. Yeah, any of the clinical fellows have any experience in residency or prior jobs or anything like that? Not with the Exeter. Not with no. the Exeter? Yeah, I, I, I have not either. Okay, all right, good. So, so I'm, I'm happy that we're that we're doing this topic and this is exactly when, uh, when Dr. Dome emailed me about a topic. I thought that this would be worthwhile because I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't have a lot of experience with it either. But by the time I left Exeter after being there for two weeks, I was brainwashed. And I thought, why am I not cementing everybody? <laughs> I, I've sort of, you know, gone, gone back because it's been a while since I've been there. But anyway, it was a pretty, pretty unique. So Exeter is this uh, smaller town. It's about 150,000 people, I think, in the very southwest uh, corner of England. You can see London there on the map. Exeter is here. So getting there was actually the first adventure. Uh, there's not really any direct access from the U.S. So you kind of got to jump around a little bit and planes, trains, and automobiles to get down there. But uh, once I got there, it was a pretty awesome place. I always like to throw a couple of pictures when I do talks like this, just because it might uh, entice someone's interest if you have any interest in going over there. 
this was a hotel that I stayed in. It was built in 1808 and was actually an eye hospital. Um, it was used during uh, World War One. So obviously, you know, rehabbed and remodeled and stuff, but pretty, pretty neat. That's just another picture of it there. The Exeter Cathedral, this was built in 1400. It's the longest single vaulted ceiling uh, in, in all of England, which I thought was pretty neat because every corner has a cathedral on it in England. So pretty cool. Just some, some neat pictures. All right, now down to the orthopedic stuff. So I also think it's interesting when learning about orthopedics in different countries, um, kind of what their pathways are, because it, it's always different. So in England, they do five years of medical school sort of this four year intermediate period, which to be honest, I couldn't quite wrap my head around. It was kind of like a really, really long internship, just doing a whole bunch of general stuff after medical school. Uh, and then six years of orthopedic surgery and then another year of fellowship. So you can see it's actually quite a bit longer uh, than our training. And then most people, um, contrary to what tends to happen, unfortunately in the US where there's a lot of people kind of bouncing around their first couple of years of their career, most people tend to stay at the same place for their entire career. The reason I called uh, Dr. Wilson, Matt Wilson, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson, that's their name over there. And it's actually a uh, surgeon viewed as an insult if they're addressed as doctor. They're, they prefer to be called Mr. That's kind of the, the culture there. Um, it's just like us, it's very, very specialized in big cities. You don't have people doing a whole lot of general stuff there. Um, you can see with that duration of training, uh, in Exeter specifically, the guys do either hips or they do knees uh, in their arthroplasty. There's, there's no one there who does hips and knees, uh, contrary to you know, what a lot of folks in our area do. The salary I also thought was uh, was interesting. Now, granted, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars, that's that's good money. But when you compare it to, you know, orthopedic surgeons across the country, that's quite quite low compared to um, compared to our uh, pay scale here. And a lot of these guys will split their time between the NHS, which is a National Health Service, or their uh, you know socialized system, however you want to call it. And there there is also a private system there as well uh, for people that have insurance and can afford to pay for it, and they can kind of split their time. This is just a couple of pictures of the outside of the hospital. The uh, Princess Elizabeth Orthopedic Center is where I spent all my time. Some of these names uh, may look familiar. Uh, their names pop up in the literature uh, quite a bit. Graham Gee is one of the guys who uh, put Exeter on the map. He was a consultant there for a very long time. I actually had the opportunity to talk with him quite a bit when I was there and meet him. It was really neat. And then the other uh, gentlemen listed there are the, the main HIP consultants. Uh, they have three fellows a year in Exeter. When I was there, there was one from England, one from Ireland, one from Sweden. And they all ran their own list. That's what they call their schedule. So just like us, it's a very uh, graduated um, system they have. And, you know, they eventually get more autonomy and off they go. So the facilities over there, I realized when I was there that we're incredibly spoiled. This is their fellow's office, just kind of this old, dark, not so, uh, not so updated place. This is their locker room in the main surgical operating room. Just people on top of each other, shoes all over the place just uh, kind of <laughs> made me made me feel very grateful for what we have. This is a picture of one of the main uh, operating theaters, they call it. On the left side, you see the OR before they've opened up for the first case of the day. And actually in the exact same room uh, is the scrub sink in the back corner. There's just a little bit of a different setup and then you see the, uh, the box above where the operating table is gonna go uh, for their exhaust system that they got in there. And then those two doors in the back corner is actually a, a bit of a um, it's like an anesthesia holding area. They actually wheel the patients in there, do the block, and then bring them into the room. So a little bit similar to you know our system that people are doing their blocks and holding. Just another picture of the operating room. To give you a sense of what the hospitals are like there, uh, six to eight patients a room with a sheet in between them. So far cry from our, our private rooms that we've got uh, all over the place here now. Patients will actually pay for TV and internet if they want it in the room. Uh, the average weight for total hip arthroplasty in the uh, NHS and all of England is about four to five months. In Exeter, because it's so well known and because they, uh, you know, do such good work and you know there's a lot of demand, it's actually a year. So people will see someone in the office, and then it might not even necessarily be the same person who performs their surgery that they see. They just get put on the list, and it's about a one-year wait. Elective total hips, their length of stay is about three to four days, uh, which again is quite a bit different. Uh, now than most of the U.S. as people are maybe moving outpatient. I'm sure you guys are doing that as well. Hip fractures quite a bit longer. They're not really in any rush there. You know, there's not the financial incentive uh, in their system that there is in our system to kind of crank out volume, which will kind of play into the, the talk a little bit later as well. Just DVT prophylaxis, just like us. And they actually don't wear the uh, the hoods like we wear. They, they wear this kind of little bonnet over their head that tucks into the, uh, tucks into the scrubs. And they actually cited a study when I was there that I thought was interesting. I'm not sure if anyone has ever seen this before, but they cited an increased risk of periprosthetic infections acutely with the exhaust suits, with the theory being that the fans in your head can actually blow air out the sleeve and cause contamination. So even without the hoods though, these guys would take aisle band and wrap it around the wrist before they put their gloves on. So just a, something 
I'd never seen in the U.S. before, but I thought it was kind of kind of unique. I'm not sure if anyone's got any experience in the uh, the veteran system here. I did quite a bit of my training there, but uh, I show this picture. You know, you thought the VA was bad. We're all about efficiency. If you look at the clock here, this is 9:30 a.m. and they haven't started their first case yet. So, <laughs> just again, sort of on a different uh, different schedule over there. Uh, the busy hip consultants will do three hips in a day. That's a full day for them. They're not running two rooms, uh, nothing like that. They're doing three in a day, and that's it. So getting now kind of into the meat of the talk, the history of the Exeter hip, which I, I spent my entire plane ride home reading this like 300-page uh, PDF uh, that they gave me, which was a textbook that was uh, recently published. So it was all about the history of the Exeter, and that's kind of what I use for the basis of a lot of these images and the presentation. I thought it was just fascinating. So Robin Ling in 1965 did this uh, McKee for our total hip at the Princess Elizabeth Orthopedist Center, uh, which is where I was. And what he noticed was that from 1965 to 69, he had very, very poor results. A lot of aseptic loosening, a lot of lysis, and you know this idea of cement disease, which it kind of still has its name, but obviously we know now that this isn't actually caused from uh, cement in most cases. So this is, was his experience. He saw a lot of resorption at the medial neck. You can see in these images here, kind of far out and panned in. If you look at the medial neck, the bone just sort of going away. And he thought that it was time for a change and he wanted to do something different. Now, interesting, I'm not sure if anyone's aware of this history, but if you wanted to do, you know, the, the, the gold standard at the time, which was what Sir John Charnley was doing, you actually had to go to England, sort of do a little, uh, you know, training under him and sort of be granted permission. But it had to be uh, via a lateral approach with a trochanteric osteotomy, sort of the only way that they would allow you to do that. Well, Mr. Ling really wanted to do a posterior approach, so he didn't want to do that. So he kind of wanted to do his own thing. And so he teamed up with an engineer named Clyde Lee from the University of Exeter, which is the town. And this is what they ultimately came up with. I'm going to show you in a couple of slides. There's a lot of different uh, design uh, features here. So one thing that you'll notice is that there's no collar on the stem. And that is uh, very, very much on purpose. And that plays a, plays a big role in how the stem actually works biomechanically. Because with a collar, the stem cannot sink down and it can't transmit the load the same way. This is a basically a dual taper. It's tapered A to P and also medial lateral. And the idea behind this is that if you've got a taper in two different directions, once you've got the cement in the canal and you've got the plug in distal, you can improve pressurization of the cement into the uh, endosteal uh, surface by pushing on it in, uh, in two different planes rather than one. And perhaps the most unique thing about this that was a little bit uh, serendipitous how this happened is that it was a highly polished implant right from the start. So at the time in England, all of the implants that were made from this particular alloy or you know mix uh, for stainless steel had to be polished just per British requirements. And so that's why it was polished. At the time, it was just because they had to. They didn't really appreciate what that meant. And I'll get to that in a minute. So November 27, 1970, they implanted the first Exeter hip, uh, Exeter hip uh, implant in Exeter at the, uh, at the same hospital. And interestingly, ever since 1970, 1971, they have not done a primary hip with any stem other than Exeter at that hospital. They do some other stuff for revisions, but whether you're 15 years old or 90 years old, you're getting an Exeter uh, at their institution, which is uh, pretty, pretty interesting. So early on, they limited the use uh, only to this hospital. And this was done for the first five years. And they were trying to be very, very responsible with this when they used this totally new implant that you can see pictured here. Um, of which this is the original version. This is a monoblock stem, and obviously doesn't quite look like that one I just showed you, but it did evolve, and I'll show that in a second. But they realized that this was a completely radical new design, and they wanted to get a lot of data on it and do it responsibly, so they didn't want to make this widespread in case it failed miserably, which was, uh, I thought, pretty uh, good, good foresight you know, on, on their part. So what they found very early is that it didn't loosen. Uh, that wasn't the reason for failure, but they found that the stem would actually fracture when it was made out of this alloy. So the stems were breaking, but they weren't coming loose as they were with these McKee for our hips that we were doing for five years prior. So in 1976, he changed to a different uh, type of stainless steel. But when they changed to that, there was no requirement in England at that time for this to be polished. And since polishing was expensive, they decided to not polish it. And so from 1976 to 86, they had the exact same design, but it was a matte finish instead of this highly polished finish. And they described this in their in their book as a serious error. And what they noticed during this 10-year time period was a whole lot of increased femoral lysis and aseptic loosening. And so from 1986 on, they went back to the uh, highly polished version that you can see here, sort of the genesis, where 1986 and 87, it was back to this uh, monoblock design. And then eventually in 1988, they went to this uh, modular design and 
more more so what it looks like uh, what it looks like now. So interesting how the STEM evolved was uh, a, a lot by accident, but then they studied it and realized that they, they really hit a home run with it. So a little bit of basic science about cement. Obviously, this is some stuff that uh, you guys are probably familiar with. But again, I made this for residents initially and just kind of left this stuff in here because I think it's a good review. So obviously, uh, there's a powder and a liquid, the polymer and the monomer. And when it's mixed, you get this sort of amorphous polymer. Um, interesting question that was asked of me as a resident, any of the clinical fellows, does anyone actually know why the cement is either white if you're using like Simplex or one of those or green if you're using Calicos? You know the reason for the color? Chlorophyll. I'm sorry? Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the color green for Palacos. Oh, uh, so it, it might be a der derivative. I'm not sure. It might be the same thing, but the, actually the reason that they color it uh, either white or green is actually to make it uh, make it visible on x-rays. So they, they add barium sulfate and zirconium dioxide on the Palacos uh, to make it visible on x-ray. So I thought that was interesting. That's how you can see your mantle and kind of know that you're doing a good job. Uh, polymerization of cement. This was something that, you know, if you have even limited experience with cemented tips, whether you're using Exeter or something else over here, one of the reasons that people don't like to uh, cement, I think, in the U.S. is just because it takes longer, right? Let's say you're doing six cases a day and cementing adds 15 minutes per case. There's one more case that you can't do if you're doing cement. Well, Simplex, if you're allowing this to go kind of at regular room temperature, how we do it here, it's usually about 14 to 15 minutes, whether you're doing a knee, even the same thing. It takes about 14, 15 minutes to dry completely. In Exeter, the way that they've got it down, they have this stuff dry in about eight and a half minutes. And I'll explain how they do that in a little bit. But the interesting part about the basic science is that complete polymerization takes about three to four weeks, actually. And there is some creep and stress relaxation, not the board of the basic science, but that, that happens overall. And by the time it's fully polymerized after that month, it has shrunk down a little bit in volume. So early on, cement is very strong in compression but it's weak in tension and shear. And so, you know, when you're loading the stem, it's strong, but any sort of twisting motion is, is, is bad. And that's specifically one of the reasons why they tell you to not toggle this thing once you're putting the cement down, or I'm sorry, putting the stem down inside. And they found in the uh, late samples that these properties uh, were maintained, the late properties at 15 to 24 years, which is pretty interesting. So this uh, quote here, I just stole straight out of the book because I couldn't have possibly said it better myself. And I'll go into detail about what this actually means, but this essentially says that the controlled subsidence of the Exeter stem is what makes it so successful. All those design features, you know, the highly polished finish, the lack of a collar, um, everything about it uh, is, is really what makes this thing work. So there is some viscoelastic uh, deformation allowed by the cement and early on and the actually throughout the life of the implant, that's what allows the stem to slowly on a very, very, very tiny scale uh, sink down inside of the cement and you'll see uh, you know what that does here. So there's basically two different uh, ideas or theories or philosophies with uh, cemented stems. On the left here, this composite beam, you can see that the idea behind this, this is a design where it's a matte finish where the cement is actually designed to stick to the stem itself. And then there's this cement bone interface uh, where if anything's going to fail or move, this is usually where it happens. On the other side, uh, with the red arrows, this is more of the Exeter design. This is called the taper slip. You can see the arrows are actually in a different location. Rather than being at the cement bone interface, these arrows are at the uh, implant cement interface. And this is showing that that allows uh, that stem to actually slip down inside of the cement mantle. So the idea here is that that cement goes into the uh, into the bone, you know, sort of like a grout, and then it stays there forever. There's no uh, there's there's no forces that are necessarily acting on that directly. The action's kind of more in the middle on that diagram. This is the design, or I'm sorry, the diagram that really made this whole idea make sense to me. If you look at A, B, C, D, this is um, what's happening with this uh, stem. So you can see A is unloaded. So let's say that this is the person, you know, right after they get their hip stem in, they're laying on the you know stretch in the recovery room or whatever, they haven't loaded this thing yet. B, when the first couple times the person starts you know, walking on this, the stem actually does sink down very, very slightly inside of that cement mantle. And what that does is put these, uh, you know, it loads the bone. And I'm gonna get to, get to that slide in a second. Uh, in C, the stem has subsided so that even a larger cross section. So again, the cement really can't go anywhere, right? Because it's plugged distally. So the only place it can go 
is outward in this direction that are shown by the arrows and load the bone, which, uh, which we like. We know that bone responds to, uh, you know, changes in load. That's Wolf's Law uh, that we'll talk about in a second. And, and, and so the point of this is that when you're walking on this and when the stem is uh, slowly subsiding down inside of that mantle, the bone is constantly being loaded. And then once the person, you know, lays down or whatever, it's not like the thing backs out. It's, it's kind of forever, you know, pushed down, you know, inside of there. And so it's always being loaded. So again, a little more basic science. Wolf still like, bone remodels and response. Yep. Go ahead. Is there an estimation of how deep it uh, subsides after during the first loads? Uh, I, there, there's some. If you look at X-rays at like a year or two follow-up, it's maybe half a millimeter, a millimeter. Usually, you can see it best on the lateral shoulder. Uh, but yeah, in, in almost all of mine, it's, I've got the same thing, and I'm, I'm certainly nowhere near as good at you know cementing technique as these guys are. Um, but it, it's pretty remarkable. So I'd say you know fraction of a millimeter to maybe a millimeter max that it sinks down. So pretty, pretty small amount. Um, but, but that's all it needs. Um, so Wolf's Law, bone remodels in response to mechanical stress and then stress shielding, uh, proximal femoral bone loss in the set of a well-fixed stem distally, right? Because that proximal bone uh, is no longer being loaded. So Wolf's Law in action. You know, this is a immediate post-op from a very old exeter that was done. And if you look at the exact same patient 10 years later, if I didn't tell you which one was the post-op and which one was 10 years, you'd be, it'd be hard for you to tell, you know, what, which one was which, right? It doesn't look much different. Although if you look very, very closely, you know, at that lateral shoulder on the 10 year, there's a tiny little amount. I don't know if you can see my cursor here of this kind of little bit of lucency right here. That's what I'm talking about. And the higher up you put, this is actually a really large stem. So it's not as, uh, not as exaggerated, but that's, uh, that's kind of that small little, uh, spot there. But if you look at the medial bone, contrary to that first example I showed you where you noticed all this quote cement disease and this medial resorption, there's none of it. All right. Uh, this is taken from uh, where I did my fellowship. Um, the Eng family, Charlie Eng was the guy who basically pioneered uh, press fit design in the U.S. in the 80s um, with these full coats and everything. If you look at the stem from 1984 versus the stem from 1990, this is, you know, stress shielding. You can see that the stem is fixed distally. But even just six years, not even 10 years, you look at what's happened to that uh, kind of metaphyseal bone adjacent to the greater trope there, you know, there, there's not much left. You know, there's obviously studies that show that it probably doesn't even matter. Uh, but the point is, you know, there, there's some uh, interesting biomechanical phenomenon going on here just based on the stem design. So the goal is to get the bone, uh, I'm sorry, the cement to interdigitate with this trabecular bone. Um, and you want to create a two to three uh, millimeter mantle uh, surrounding the stem to allow this. Well, how do you make this happen? So this is now kind of the step-by-step -step of what they do. Um, any questions at this point up until now about the you know, design or history or points or anything you're curious about? Alex, in terms of the, um, the concept of um, the rough versus the polished, um, basically the, they cited the rough as a, a serious mistake because it led to um, a lack of motion between the uh, cement and the and the implant, which led to uh, increase in motion between the cement and the and the bone, as um, as best we understand. Was that concept really discovered with the Exeter, or were other implants sort of simultaneously discovering the same thing in the history? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that a lot of this was, uh, you know, they were kind of doing stuff sort of against serendipitously, and then it wasn't until they actually went back and looked and they said oh maybe that's what was going on here so i think that it was that that abrasive uh, finish and that's why if you look at that uh, that 10 year window from 76 to 86 when they actually put a matte finish with no collar so they had a rough and they so it was allowed to subside technically but it was causing this abrasive you know you're getting these little cement particles generated or metal shards or whatever it might have been um that they realized they, that the highly polished part was a crucial component of this design so sort of only long in retrospect did they realize what had actually been going on? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So Alex, sort of, uh, another yep, question. Uh, has, has their cementing technique changed since the 60s, 70s? Yes, you know, very much so. Generations of cementing and all that. Yep, so, so they went through the exact same thing, you know, first, second, third generation. Initially when they were doing these, um, I don't know, I'm not gonna go back and think because I'll probably screw up my screen share, but. You know, yeah, they, they weren't using uh, in, you know, 1970, 71, when I started doing this, they weren't using a, a distal cement plug. They were finger packing. They weren't pressurizing. Um, and it was still working pretty well. So, yeah, they went through that same genesis, you know, generation one 
two, three. And the head diameter was 22.2 in the earlier generations or it's always been 28? Uh, good question. I don't know. I think that that was a 28. It looked a little bit larger. Um, it looked a little bit larger to me than the 22, um, but I'm not exactly positive. Now, of course, it's modular, and so you can kind of use whatever you want. Um, uh, earlier design almost looked like it's an offshoot of Chanli, like a banana stem, the banana-shaped stem with an yeah. extra shoulder. Yeah, with an extra shoulder. Yeah, I agree. And that was, again, he was the one kind of putting modern hip arthroplasty on the map, and so I think that everyone was kind of seeing what was what he was doing and, you know, they wanted to be different, but they still probably went back there a little bit to what they thought worked at the time. Yep. So sort of the, you know, step-by-step step now getting into it uh, technique wise, if anyone's going to attempt this, um, preoperative planning is obviously very important. I'm sure you guys uh, template most, if not all of your hips. And it's, it's the same way with this. This is actually a, a template that I did uh, when I got back. Um, just a couple of different things on this that's, pretty important. So similar to most templates you've probably seen, you know, pick a spot, whether it's the bottom of the ischium, inside of the teardrop, to the lesser trope, greater trope, whatever you want to use to get your, excuse me, leg length, uh, measure the angle of the cup. But this angle, I'm sorry, not this angle, this measurement is actually very important and they rely on it heavily, is the distance from the lateral shoulder to the tip of the trope. So you just draw a straight line on the lateral shoulder here of the stem and then a line uh, that's parallel to it go into the tip of the greater troke, and then you can see uh, 8.5 uh, millimeters down here. This is very important intra-op, and you have to make sure that these x-rays are calibrated appropriately because they rely on this heavily to get their leg lengths because with this highly polished design, as I'll get into, both the blessing and the curse of this stem is that you can put it literally wherever you want it. The level of the neck cut is pretty irrelevant because this thing doesn't have a collar on it. You can sink it, you can float it, you can put whatever version on it you want, and that's what makes it so versatile, but it also makes it so challenging to, to learn how to use. And so that's one of the checks that they use for uh, for their leg lengths. And you can see this is one that they did uh, in Exeter. Um, you can see that they've got the same um, measure. Actually, it's not showing up very well there, but they, they uh, measure that the same way. So starting with the box osteotome, and this is all, again, done via a posterior approach. You can do this via an anterior approach. I've done a number of them. Uh, and I, I do almost probably 98, 99% of my primary hips are an anterior approach. So I, I feel like I'm pretty competent with it. Obviously, still getting better. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit more challenging just because you need a completely straight shot down the canal to make the stem uh, work. And so this is all with reference to a posterior approach just for, uh, you know, for your sake. So you kind of know where we're coming at here. So starting with a box osteotome. Uh, to remove the cancellous bone like you normally would. They commonly would use a burr to get the correct starting point. Now, there's a diagram uh, that they've gotten there just to show. So if you remember, the femoral neck is a very anterior structure relative to the shaft of the femur. So actually getting the appropriate starting point to go straight down the canal, you've actually got to be quite a bit posterior uh, on that. And this is another reason why from an anterior approach, if you think about it, you got to get posterior on the neck. That's actually you know pushing quite a ways into the body, and I know you guys do into your approach, and so you got to make sure you got an appropriate uh, release to get your hand all the way in there if you're going to get this right. And then also, uh, like any you know stem that's got to go straight down the diaphysis um, in a straight shot, you got to make sure that you're getting out far enough lateral into the greater stroke uh, to get the starting point. So this is really where the where the action's at, kind of getting the starting point all the way uh, back out here. So. Once they do this, they would access the canal with a small hand reamer. They would go halfway down and then uh, wash. They would wash frequently. You'll notice that in these bullet points just to prevent, uh, help to mitigate the risk of, uh, of fat emboli uh, during this case. They really want to keep that canal as dry as possible. That's one of the knocks on uh, cementing is the possibility for fat emboli. But if you're careful with the technique, uh, they've, they've shown that this is pretty successful. Then they take that same reamer, go all the way down the canal, wash again, next hand reamer. And they would focus on, again, staying lateral into the greater trope. Uh, just to make sure that they could get that straight shot. So at this point, they would size the canal for the distal plug. They had specialized jigs there that would make sure this is for the, uh, the, the cement restrictor eventually. They'd want to make sure that that plug was, uh, was fitting appropriately. And then what they would do, they would kind of poke around, you know, within the abductor tendon and uh, some of the residual tissue that's left there to find the tip of the greater trope. And they would mark this actually with a spinal needle. And so this is, again, going back to how they templated on the tip of the trope to get that distance. So they would put a spinal needle so they knew exactly where the tip of the trope was. And then they would mark the brooch handle uh, corresponding to the depth on the template. So they would you know, put the brooch handle that would attach on, and let's say on that specific example, they would measure eight and a half millimeters up on that brooch handle, You know, just mark it with a marking pen. And then once they sunk the brooch to that depth, then that was where they were comfortable 
and pretty confident that uh, they were at least going to be in the right ballpark. So then they begin broaching, just like you do with any stem. This is a, a broach-only system. It's not a, not a ream and then broach aside from that initial reamer, but you don't have to do it with every size. Um, and so they broach, and then once they got the trial in there, uh, place the head, uh, reduce it, and trial. So you can see this line here. This is what they would draw on the actual broach handle. So they would measure the distance from the lateral shoulder here to here. And then once this line was kind of level with the uh, that spinal needle, that's how they would assess their depth. Now you also have to take care to uh, be able to reproduce your version. So it's nice when this thing is stuck in here, but then when you again put the final cemented stem in, you can twist that thing literally any direction that you want. And so they would mark this L on the bone here that I've highlighted, uh, and they would put that at one of these dots. So the Exeter system has these three dots that are used for reference. So you know now when you put the final stem in because it has the exact same dots on it, you want to go right in between the third and the second dot, and you want that dot to line up with your uh, with your L, and that's going to put you uh, you know the correct version there. So remove the trial brooch again. Wash distal plug. And this is crucial for this closed cavity and pressurization. And then they would tell their uh, their assistant to you know go ahead and mix, and they would vacuum mix this for 30 seconds while you're washing again. Now their technique um, that they used was different than anything that I'd ever seen. Uh, here, pretty much everyone would put an epi sponge down the canal if you're cementing and then just leave it there and then take it out. Well, what they do is actually take a red rubber catheter and they cut the tip off of it. They connect that to the suction. And so they put the red rubber catheter all the way down after they put the plug and then they pack the, uh, pack the canal with either a, a vag lap or a, a gauze to keep it dry. So they've got the NG tubing or the red rubber catheter down there, you know, sucking any blood that might come out while, um, while plugging the canal with the, uh, with the gauze. And that's how they would keep the canal dry. They actually didn't use, uh, use epi there, which I thought was interesting. I don't really see the harm in it, but they didn't find the need for it. So you'd keep that in until the cement uh, is ready. And this will be usually going in around three minutes because they've got it down to such a perfect science there. They didn't really do it based on the feel of cement. The room temperature was always controlled. Uh, everything was perfect. And so they would do this always based on time. So at three minutes, they'd start putting the cement and, you know, retrograde fill while pulling out at the same time. And careful not to let the cement fill around the tip of the gun because then when you pull the gun out, you're going to get these, uh, these bubble pockets in there. So pressurize with the gun and then uh, time this again. And so at four minutes and 15 seconds or 4.30, remove the gun and put the stem to the correct depth inversion, keeping your thumb over the medial calcar. Uh, what can happen if you don't do that is one, it's very easy to put the stem in varus, which of course you don't want to do with a cemented stem. And two, it helps to keep the uh, keep everything pressurized. It's just um, one less spot for the cement to come out while you're doing it. So thumb over the medial calcar, put the cement uh, stem down, and then remove your thumb if the insertion is too hard. They're timing this, and again, they're very, very good at it. If you try to get too fancy with this and you wait too long to put the stem in, or you've heated it, or you've heated the cement, or whatever, this can be an absolute disaster. I don't know if anyone's experienced that. Luckily, I personally haven't, but I've heard of stories that have where you're getting a cemented stem halfway down and you can't get any more. <laughs> that'll that'll add a couple hours to your a uh, couple hours to your day. Um, so they remove the inserter, and that's it. So they want to make sure that there's some stem uh, or some cement, sorry, over the lateral shoulder of the implant. If the version needs a little bit of fine tuning, it's better to push on the cement. It's Itself, because then everything kind of moves as a unit rather than twisting the stem because then there's potential to inter, uh, introduce some uh, air bubbles and then remove the residual cement and then again it's dried about eight to nine minutes so my question what I wondered how on earth do you do that you know how do you set it up so fast so the powder and the monomer are both heated actually they take the liquid and the powder and they put it in a, uh, in a, a heater a saline warmer in the operating room and then they also take the stem and they put it in a uh, warm saline bath that's heated to 55 degrees Celsius. So they're heating both of these things, which obviously helps the, uh, helps the uh, process happen faster. The centralizer that you put on the bottom of the stem is also made out of the same material as cement, uh, just without the barium. That's why it's clear. And so you don't want to heat that. Interesting uh, story. Shortly after I came back from Exeter, I was doing uh, a number of these. And my, my rep actually wanted to speed things along. And so he heated the stuff and didn't tell me. And when I was trying to squeeze the cement into the canal, right before it got out, I realized that it was impossible and then found out that he had heated it. So luckily I didn't get any in the canal, but that would have been an absolute mess. So this is a very good technique, but definitely shouldn't be uh, introduced until everybody knows exactly what they're doing uh, with, with cementing, which takes takes a while. So next little section here is, you know, why use cement and why specifically Exeter? And I would say, because it works. Again, I've mentioned this before, since 1970, 
this hospital has not used anything other than an exer for a primary hip, regardless of you know whether the person had birthies or dysplasia or they were 22 years old or whether they were 90. You know, it, it's so versatile um, that they use it for everybody. This is just a, a table of some of the uh, big studies that have been done about survivorship. The one that I'll highlight here was uh, from 2009, so even a little bit old now. But basically, 94% survivorship at 33 years for aseptic loosening, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. Um, this, this one, you know, really, really made made sense to me, and I thought, wow, this is pretty incredible. And if you look down this list, 100%, 100%, 100%, you know. Granted, you got to read every study crucially and realize who's doing it and techniques and everything like that. But, uh, you know, actually at the place where it's pioneered, 94% at 33 years for loose stem is uh, pretty remarkable. So uh, it's very versatile, as I mentioned, the same stem for every possible situation. You can dial in the neck length and the version and the, uh, the relative length of your neck cut isn't all that important, actually. It might make your x-rays look a little bit goofy, but you can sync this thing or float it as high up as you want. Um, and the data that they have certainly supports its use in all age groups. Ease of revision. This is one that uh, a, a myth a bit that was dispelled for me when I was there. Their logic behind this uh, is that when you have this taper slip design, if you need to revise the cup or even revise the stem and go to a bigger offset for instability or whatever the case is, you know, cement and cement revision is, is quite easy with this. You can use just one tap of the, uh, you know, from underneath and this stem goes flying right out. And then in some cases, people actually put the exact same one back down. There is a revision style that's uh, built on purpose to be two millimeters uh, smaller, so you can just re-cement into the same mantle if you're happy with it. One thing that I saw when I was there is that they were actually doing an isolated cup revision, and just because they didn't want to deal with the trunnion getting in the way when they were doing their cup revision, they knocked the stem out and then put in one of those uh, revision style ones right after, just cemented right back into the same mantle. So it can make things uh, a little bit easier in that regard if you're uh, skilled with it. And then the ease of fixing periprosthetic fractures. I also thought, what on earth are you talking about until I saw them do it? And it's actually kind of interesting uh, analogy that they made. They said, you know, we always think that cement is a mess and it's going to get in the way and this and that. The analogy that they made is that let's say that you have a elderly person with very thin, you know, kind of crummy osteoporotic bone. We all know that trying to put cables around that, trying to put screws into it, whatever the case, it just doesn't bite. There's no fix. Well, when you have a nice cement mantle already built in, it's almost like you're taking a thousand piece puzzle that might be very thin, small pieces, and you're making it into like a child puzzle that's very thick you know, larger pieces. And you can actually use that for, uh, you know, fixation. You can put screws into it. It, it does provide a little bit more robustness, uh, if that's even a word, to, you know, put cables around and sort of strengthen the design. So they actually view it as a positive. And I saw a case there that was, uh, was pretty neat. Um, one of the points that they made when I was there, uh, they thought that it was only a matter of time in the U.S. before insurance companies you know, start getting a hold of some of the emerging data that I'm sure probably a lot of you have seen, specifically uh, around uh, femoral neck fractures with cemented versus uh, uncemented hemiarthroplasty in the uh, risk of periprosthetic fracture with thrust fit compared to cement. And so that's just what this, uh, what this shows here. The uncemented hemiarthroplasty may result in higher hip scores, but appears to carry an unacceptably uh, high risk for later femoral fractures. Another study, just to highlight the bottom line here in conclusion, our data do not support the use of an uncemented stem for femoral neck. And so this is from 2015. Who knows if this will, you know, actually take hold at the insurance payer level. I have no idea. That was just one of the things that they like to razz me about when I was there. Um, but certainly there, there's definitely data that, that says that for most people that are having a femoral neck fracture, by definition, they're osteoporotic, they probably should be cemented. And, and we definitely don't do that all the time here. When I was over there, uh, the longest surviving exeter actually came into clinic for a post-op follow-up. And if you look at both of these sockets, they've, they've been revised a hundred times. Um, but on the right side there, that one was put in 1976. And on the left, that was one of the, um, you know, original designs from 1971. And to address that same question from before, you know, the, the cement technique, if you look at this compared to, uh, you know, what they would consider a satisfactory uh, radiographic appearance of their mantle now, they would probably cringe. You know, there's no restrictor. The cement mantle's not very good, but that stem is the original from 1971, never been touched. And so even with the uh, older generation technique, it's still still there. So some misconceptions about uh, cemented total hips, which I think is, you know, a lot of these are the reasons why we don't do a whole lot of them in the U.S. You know, it takes too long. So I already talked about this a little bit, but they heat this and they've got this really down to a science and it's dry by eight to nine minutes. So there is a way, there is a way around that that doesn't have to be true. One of the things that I was always taught is that as it hardens, it expands, it actually shrinks. Uh, the expansion is actually backflow of blood. So 
if you're seeing the cement expanding as it hardens, that probably means that you haven't done a great job of getting a hemostasis in the canal. And there's actually some bleeding from the cancellous bone that just by pure volume might be pushing the cement out. Uh, you know, it's dangerous. We, we've heard of this, uh, you know, fat embolus. People will say, I don't want to cement because it takes time and it's going to give my people uh, emboli and they're going to die. They've got, you know, the series from 1988 to 2005, over 9,000 primary exitors. They had 21 deaths within 30 days, which, of course, nobody wants 21 deaths. But when you consider it within that uh, set of patients, you know, 0.2% and only one intraoperative death of, uh, of 9,000 patients in a 93-year-old female. So if you do it properly and you wash, 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 as I've mentioned here and talked about in the step-by-step -step technique, you can uh, minimize the uh, risk of that. So why don't we cement in the U.S.? And Dr. Dome, this is uh, a little bit back to, I don't know what they fully understood, you know, at the time, but the, uh, the, the Harris hip, definitely one of these matte finish designs. Um, and this is where they noticed that it didn't really work very well. And this happened to be at a high volume place. And so people kind of got turned off to it, right? The cement disease. And that was with one of those designs that that was, uh, that was playing into it probably. You know, I think we're all definitely to a large extent a product of our training. If this is something you've never seen in residency, you had no exposure to it, there's not really a great reason to go out and start doing it on your own if you've never seen it. And so I think the more cementing is taught the proper way, uh, I think that people can, can utilize it. And then certainly this uh, financial component that I alluded to a little bit before on both the surgery and the industry side. So on the surgeon side, right, I give the example of if every case is taking you 10, 15 minutes longer, there's one more hip that you can't do during the day if you're cementing. So there, there's one of the, uh, one of the downsides. And on the industry side as well, this is a stem that's been around forever. Uh, it, it's actually, uh, Stryker is the company who makes it currently. It used to be uh, Osteonics, I believe. Um, but, you know, I've talked to some of those guys, and, and the, nobody's got any ill intent here, but I think the, the reality is that the stem doesn't cost as much as, as some of the newer, uh, the newer designs. And so there's a financial component on the, on the industry side uh, as well. So just a, a slide here that I threw in from my fellowship. So I had mentioned that the... Uh, Dr. Charlie Yang in the 80s was kind of the, the main guy in the U.S. Uh, that sort of pioneered press fit design with his diaphyseal fit, and that's where the AML came from with the Anderson Clinic. And so that was one of the things that you came out of there historically um, doing a whole lot of, and that fellowship has been around since the 80s. Uh, I was, I believe, part of the first class. We didn't do a single AML in 2016. And in fact, uh, Dr. Charles' uh, son, Andy Yang, who's the Anderson Clinic now, is in fact cementing. So... It's, uh, it's, it's crazy that I think that some of this data is, uh, you know, catching on. It's interesting because cemented hips is kind of where it all started, and then we largely got away from it. And we still are in the U.S., but it's, uh, it's sort of making a comeback a little bit, I think. So that was uh, kind of interesting. And that's, again, nothing to knock on, you know, uncemented stems. That's what I use still 98% of the time. They're very, very good. This is a, a study out of Anderson, you know, 98% survivorship, you know, and it's so they, they work as well. And this was at a mean of 22 years. So those work very good too. It's just, uh, you know, different ways to skin a cat and kind of presenting uh, both cases. So this is a uh, lady who had staged hips a long time ago. This is that example from that periprosthetic that I showed you. This would, uh, you know, the stem is simple here. So this would be more of a Vancouver C type, uh, but you still got to fix it. So they use the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, this was the uh, post-operative x-ray, so the screws can actually get pretty good purchase in this otherwise, you know, osteoporotic elderly lady because the cement's there. Putting those cables around there can actually make things a little bit more uh, robust, and you can see they got a nice reduction, a uh, whole lot of hardware in there, just the post-op x-rays. So they did this in a lateral position on a regular table. They used zero intraop fluoro, which coming from Loyola, where we did a whole lot of trauma with a bunch of Harborview trained guys, was very foreign to me. Um, but no floral in the entire case. This is all direct visualization, just kind of getting their reduction with sequential tightening of their cables. Um, and then eventually, uh, you know, getting the, getting the plate and screws in there. And the uh, post-op x-ray is not done until a couple of days later. So this is the last little bit of the talk here. This was one thing that I thought was uh, very fascinating. Um, is anyone familiar or has anyone ever done a femoral impaction bone grafting or heard of the technique, Dr. Dome? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you heard yep. of it, AJ? Yeah, a little bit for the, uh, I've seen it in residency um, for, a, for an acetabulum, um, yep. like a, uh, a reverse ream type of thing, but nothing for the uh, stem. Nothing for the stem, got it. So I've, I've also never seen this in action. I was, I was bummed. There was like two of these cases that were listed on the schedule and I was there, but they both canceled for different reasons. And so I didn't get to see this when I was there, but I was able to talk to uh, Mr. G when I was over there, who's actually the first guy to ever do this. And so the story was, 
he was a fellow at uh, in Exeter in April of uh, 87. And he had three cases on that day. He had two primary hips. And then the last hip was a multiple revised femur that just didn't have any proximal uh, bone stock left. I'll show you the x-rays in a minute here. Um, and so he wanted to experiment. He basically uh, asked the attending, you know, can I, can I do this idea that he had? And so the idea was these small bone chips could be impacted into the femur to essentially reconstitute the medullary canal prior to cementing a new stem. And the most uh, interesting, <laughs> cringeworthy part of this, where did the graft come from? The femoral heads from the first two hips of that day. So they saved them and just put them in the third patient. Obviously, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd get quite a bit of jail time for trying to pull something like that today. But, um, you know, it's interesting. They still do that. Um, on a little bit of a different level in Exeter, they do so many hips there. They keep every femoral head that they take out and they uh, they process it and they keep it at like, I think it's like minus 60 for six months. And so they have a ever refilling bone bank for when they need to do these cases. They've got their own, uh, their own, you know, re refilling, uh, refilling bone bank at the, at the hospital. So he was onto something and that person did okay. So I thought that was uh, pretty, pretty fascinating when he told me. So this is just a little bit of their technique here. So they put this plug distal and there's a whole bunch of specialized instruments that allow people to accomplish this. So I wouldn't recommend trying it without this stuff. There's a very specific way to do it. I've still never done it because I've never seen it, but it's pretty fascinating. So they basically just take these things and they're really, from my understanding, wailing on this, uh, this mallet to really whack this uh, cantellus bone down to really make sure that it's uh, impacted in there very firmly. And so you can see as the picture goes to the right here, they're um, you know, getting this impacted down. And then They've got the canal reconstituted, basically. They will broach and then put the cement in. They're pressurizing the cement and then put the stem back in, just like they, uh, just like you normally would. So this is actually the first case that was ever done by Mr. Gee. You look at that uh, proximal femur on the left side there, you can see that that stem is loose. The stem's gone into varus. The mantle's broken there distally. A lot of problems going on. So you can imagine when you take out that, there's really no bone left. And so he did this impaction grafting, and that's his immediate post-operative film. Um, you can see, again, no... Um, no plug, it doesn't look like what they do have a centralizer, but he's got a reasonable mantle around some bone that otherwise wasn't there. And if you look at the follow-up from five years later, uh, pretty remarkable uh, how, how well that worked out. Here's another example, a preoperative case that they did, immediate post-op, and then 27 months, and then four years down the road with this uh, thermal impaction bone grafting. Um, this is the last slide. This was a picture of Mr. Gee that they actually had. They gave it as a gift, and they had it hanging there. <laughs> if you look at this closely, it's pretty funny. They have him. Apparently, he wasn't a... Uh, fan favorite among the staff because these thermal impaction grafting cases would take like five hours. So you can see four units of blood on the floor for the second time around. They're, they're burning the midnight oil. <laughs> People are falling asleep in the back of the room and he's just there with his, uh, his, his, his stool that's taking wood on the floor, just banging and wailing away. And I think so. I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty comical. So that's uh, that's a little bit about Exeter. I appreciate you guys, uh, your attention and want to open it up if anyone's got any other questions. Uh, Alex, that was a fantastic, um, fantastic lecture. Thanks very much for sharing your experience and what a great experience to have had as well at, uh, at Exeter. Um, that's, that's really wonderful for us. And uh, like most places in the States, uh, we, uh, we certainly lean toward uncemented uh, femoral stems uh, with the American Hip Institute. Uh, I do cement uh, probably more than most American surgeons. Um, I came through uh, HSS for residency at the time when uh, uncemented stems were really just starting. So they were st still doing more hybrids uh, than not. Um, so uh, I think that, that one of the most central questions coming out of this talk is, why do you still do most of your um, stems uncemented? Yeah, so I, I admittedly, I think I definitely fall into that exact same uh, camp of that one slide that I put up, the reasons why we don't cement in the U.S. Uh, a lot of it is time, to be honest. A lot of it is ease um, and just kind of a lack of hassle, to be very honest, um, I think, in my own hands. It's what I was most extensively trained on. I did a little bit of cement, and then, you know, when I was in Exeter, I saw a little bit more of it. Um, but I believe also I just presented that obviously was a, a little bit of a bias towards cementing, but there's certainly great evidence that fresh fit stems are phenomenal for the most part. Obviously, every company's got uh, some designs that haven't performed so well. Um, but I think for, for ease, convenience, speed, you know, getting through the day a little bit faster, I, I think those are all those are all the main reasons. Um, to be honest, when I uh, left Exeter, I came back thinking I was going to be cementing like 50% of my people. And then <laughs> as I got, you know, further and further away from that experience, I, I just kind of settled back into what I was used to and 
so that, that that's still mostly what I do now. I, I am very grateful that I had this experience though. Um, because I, I definitely still, I'm, I'm like you, I cement a lot more than most people. It's not that I never do it. Certainly, if I'm doing any femoral neck fracture, I, I can't recall the last time I didn't cement one, even if I was doing a total hip. I've done primary exit or total hips on the, on femoral neck fractures for active patients. you got an 85-year-old guy who's walking two miles a day or whatever. You know, certainly do total hips on them, and I'll do a, a, a primary exit uh, from the front. Um, so I still do it, um, but I think all, those are all the reasons. Is So backing out the surgeon's own interest, if we think purely of the patient's interest, um, do you think that uh, all patients are better, would be better served with a cemented uh, stem, or do you think that some patients, uh, and if so, which, uh, would be better served uh, with a, a cemented stem that currently you're doing with an uncemented? Um, so I, I think that there's definitely a lot of judgment on the surgeon's part that needs to go into that. Um, I've definitely seen a fair number of people, even from, you know, my own institution, unfortunately, in, you know, surrounding areas where it might've been, let's say, for example, a, an 89 year old person who's got a, you know, femoral neck fracture and they were treated with a, you know, uncemented single wedge taper design. And that person has a stumble at their nursing home and they come in with a periprosthetic fracture. You know, there's those, unfortunately, I think are, are, are too common. That's the main reason why I cement almost all these people. So I think it's hard to say that, you know, every single person absolutely needs it because perhaps you're going to treat the 65 year old who gets a displaced femoral neck fracture differently than the 92 year old. And you got to look at the x-ray and the femur type and all those kind of things. So I don't know that you should say everybody, but I think that the data is pretty clear. There's a lot of different studies out now showing, you know, I've seen anywhere from five to nine times increased risk periprosthetic fracture risk after uh, uh, hemiarthroplasty or total hip for a femoral neck fracture. Um, when, when using an uncemented design. So I definitely lean more towards cement, but it's, it's not the norm. And I, I think it probably should be more of the norm. And to, to be fair to you, um, you, you live in a country and in a city where um, uncemented stems are kind of the standard of care and standard of care is determined a lot by what's around you. Uh, so it is, it is hard to go totally against the grain of the uh, uh, community and country in which you live. Um, so uh, let me open it up to everybody else for, uh, for questions. Alex, that was great. Um, I just had a couple of questions regarding the technique. Um, you pointed out uh, how how critical their their pre-op template is, um, and uh, even with regard to the version of the stem being placed, um, you also mentioned how they're uh, they're using a burr to to really access the canal um, in line with their their uh, stem placement. Um, it just, it seemed the, um, the, the burr was sort of creating a little bit of anaversion to the stem by default uh, because it was posteriorized for the starting point. Do you then uh, take that into account, uh, number one? And then number two, I probably goes back to the beginning of your talk with regard to the subsidence of the subsidence of the, uh, the stem. Do you take that into account for leg lengths or is it so minimal uh, that you don't really have to worry about uh, losing length uh, on, the, on the overall uh, implant itself? Yeah, so to answer the second question first, yeah, it, it's so minimal. Um, that one extra, I didn't have a good example, unfortunately, in that talk uh, to show you that lateral shoulder, but it, it's very minimal. It's not like any appreciable where, you know, if, if depending on what you read, you know, patients probably can't really appreciate much beyond, you know, five millimeters, four millimeters of leg length difference. So it's by no means anywhere near that. So it's a very small amount, so people don't really appreciate it. Um, your first question, uh, Forgive me if I if I missed part of it, but uh, you know mainly the using the burr is essentially to get lateral on that greater troke, and that's mainly to get straight down the canal, right? If you look at I don't know what implants you guys use, and to avoid using you know uh, you know commercial terms or use any companies, but if you've got you know one of these more modern stems that might specifically be designed for an anterior approach, you know these shorter things with the shoulder cut out, you can kind of ride down the you know medial calcar as you're inserting it from an anterior approach or whatever you really can't do that with the exeter. You, you really got to make sure that you're getting it straight down the canal, more like a, uh, you know, like a proximal fit and fill, you know, older school press fit stem. So the version, you kind of use the, uh, you know, the, the neck cut as a guide, just like you would with kind of a normal hip. And so when you broach and then you put the cement in, the, the final stem is actually a little bit smaller than the broach. And so you can actually kind of fine tune it. And so that's how they, you know, address that if they need to. Okay, so essentially your, your, the canal, is, the preparation is the same regardless of the native version, but you can then dial in uh, or dial down uh, any, any version that you want prior to the, the hardening of the, the cements. 
you you can yeah and again that that's the, the that's the blessing and the curse of it right if you if you put the brooch in what a good spot is and you're happy with your trial but then when you cement it you're not paying attention you add an extra you know 20 degrees of antiversion and then on your final stem all of a sudden it's unstable you're kind of you're kind of in trouble you, you know luckily it's easy to knock out and you can actually you know i did see a revision when i was over there for that exact reason where it was instability like later on they knocked the stem out and then all they did was use a burr to remove some more of the cement so that they could actually change the version of the stem they put cement in and they they you know took 15 degrees of version off it or whatever it was and you know sort of revised it that way so that's uh, again what i tell everyone is the, the blessing and the curse of this design is that it's easy to screw up yeah, right. If you do a revision of a cemented stem, Alex, um, do you do um, a cement in cement uh, revision where you don't necessarily go to great lengths to get out all the cement from the original uh, implant? Yeah, so I, I think it definitely, I'll, I'll be honest, that hasn't come up. I, I've seen so few cemented stems either that I've done or luckily I haven't revised my own uh, by this point. Because they, uh, they don't loosen. <laughs> yeah, all right. So I, I haven't seen, you know, I haven't really seen any of those from the community, but you know, it, it, I'm, Obviously, it depends on the indication, right? That's not an option, you know, in the situation of an infection or something like that. Then you don't have a choice. You got to dig it all out. But uh, it, you, you can do that. Um, some people will actually put the exact same stem back in, which I know is published. I think that's kind of a little crazy. I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. So there is a revision line of uh, Exeter where it's the exact same size. Everything It's just a, uh, a little bit uh, smaller. And so it allows you to cement inside of that mantle. So if you're revising for whatever reason and you want to... Um, you know, make things easier. Yeah, just put new cement back in that mantle, put a new stem and that's it. Um, one thing that I should also note is that uh, they're trying to cater since anterior approach has gotten so much more popular, probably not in England as much as it has here, but the standard length of an Exeter stem uh, for most sizes on the bigger sizes is 150 millimeters. They have a 125 millimeter version now of every size. And so I've used that the last couple I've done from an anterior approach, just makes things a little bit easier. You don't have as long of a stem to get down from the front. So that's another, uh, an option if anyone you know, considering that. Dr. Tauschen, do you template your neck cut? Uh, on, on the, uh, on the Exeter? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't. So it's just kind of, I, I, sh I shouldn't say that. I, I put the stem where it belongs and then I kind of note where the neck cut should be, if that makes sense. Uh, the reason that it's not super important when templating an Exeter is because of that exact reason that you may or may not pay attention to it. You know, you may float it up from that neck cut. You may sink it down below that neck cut. So I think the more important thing to note from a leg length standpoint is kind of that lateral shoulder to the tip of the greater distance for intra op decision making. Obviously, if you're using a press fit stem that's got a collar on it, as some of the newer ones do or whatever, your neck cut's definitely a whole lot more important because if you leave that neck cut too long, that leg's going to be too long and you get nothing else you can do about it. Um, Dr. Dome, I want to go back real quick to one of the questions you asked. Um, you know, why do I still use uncemented far more often than I cement? I honestly think I'm just far more comfortable doing it. Technically speaking, I, I like to think I, I do more cement than a lot of people in the area, but I still think I'm far better at doing the press fit that I'm used to. I, I, my, I, I worry a little bit, you know, about my mantles and am I doing a good job and this and that. And, you know, if it's a toss up, if I think I can get that potentially, you know, thicker person off the table and it's not going to be, you know, a, a poor decision to use a press based stem, and that's what I would do. But depending on the indication, I'm, I'm cementing most of these neck fractures. I have a question. question. Yeah. yeah, Kobe here. Um, now that patients are more educated um, and they come to your office uh, knowing a lot about the approach, a lot about the, the implant. Um, do you find, do you see some uh, uh, patients hesitant to, uh, to cope with having a cemented implant or uh, no problem, uh, you don't see any problem with that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I have not really had an issue with that after appropriate explanation, meaning most people, you know, we live in an area where people are you know, pretty educated. They, for the most, a lot of times they kind of know what they're getting themselves into. And if I see a 70, uh, you know, 79 year old female with a, you know, really, really crummy looking bone in her x-ray, I definitely do a fair number of primary elective hips and I'll cement them right off the bat um, if the bone quality looks like it needs it. And I'll just explain that to them. I'll say, look, these are sort of different ways to do the exact same thing. I'll explain to them that the gold standard in the U.S. is uncemented, but the gold standard in many other parts of the world is cement. And for reason A, B, and C, I think that cement is in your best interest. And then oftentimes I'll actually mention to them that, you know, I've done a little bit more of this than a lot of people have. And this is what I think is, you know, in your best interest. Um, 
I had another experience uh, about a year after I was in practice. I went out to uh, Virginia and watched the guy uh, out there who does a lot of uh, exiters via an anterior approach because I wanted to see his technique. And uh, for him, he's probably more on the extreme side of things. Uh, but any patient over the age of 70 getting an elective hip is getting cement if he's doing it. So some people will say 75, some will say 80. This guy says 70. He feels that strongly about it. So again, there, there's differences. I wouldn't say that the cementing is so well known by the general community that they're asking about it unless I bring it up. Um, so it does come up sometimes. Is that Joe Moscow that you uh, observed with him? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think he, really, he makes some really strong arguments for it. Um, and, uh, you know, if you listen to his arguments, you come away thinking, gosh, this pendulum is going to swing back in the United States. Yep, agree. And that, that's, uh, you know, I, I felt that way when I left Exeter and I felt that way on the, on the flight home from there. I'm like, why, why am I not doing more of these? And you, I, I kind of would go in waves, to be honest. I would start, I would do more of them and then drift back. And so it's been a little while since I did that, but you know, we're, I think we're kind of creatures of habit. And as much as I would, would like to make that, uh, you know, more of an efficient workflow, you know, I, I quite honestly, I don't do enough of them to make it, you know, routine for my staff and stuff like that. So yeah, those are so Again, all some it, of the reasons. It's hard not to be influenced by your environment and your community, and um, you know even even your staff. And when they never see a cemented uh, stem with anybody except you, and you're the irregularity, it makes it harder for you to uh, to do it. Yeah, hundred percent. And it it, it, does, it throws the room into a tizzy. People, you know, they don't know what they're they they, they get they get nervous. They don't know how to mix the cement. They don't, which is I, I think it's it's a little odd because. They, they did a knee the case before, right? So it's not much different, but when it's a hip, it's an entirely different ball game for some reason. Have you used, um, or do you have any thoughts on the um, uh, air, air, air lavage uh, products um, to clean the bone? You know, I have not seen that. My exposure that's been very limited, to honestly, only to like ads and seeing it at, you know, various meetings and the technical exhibits and stuff. I have no experience using that. I've never trained on or anybody who did it. Um, but I, I think it's a you know very very interesting idea. I know people can do it for knees or or for hips to to do that. And I don't see how it could cause any harm. You know, playing other things, time, cost. I don't really know anything about it uh, to comment on any further. But I think it's an interesting idea that could probably provide some benefit. Uh, so what are your thoughts on like uh, current fellowship residency training? What, what's um how best to, to expose, uh, you know, young surgeons to this kind of stuff, myself included. I, you know, I, I didn't, everything was press fit in residency for me. Um, uh, obviously, I've, I've trained now uh, since residency and fellowships. And I've seen a handful, uh, done a handful of cemented work, but it's it's still very far, uh, you know, uh, between cases. Um, this day and age, you think there's enough exposure um, uh, that's happening uh, early on? No, I, I don't think there is. And that's one of the reasons I think I was so lucky to be able to have this opportunity to go to Exeter and then go out and see Dr. Moscow. And, you know, it, it's unfortunately up to the surgeons, I think, probably individually, if they're not comfortable once they're done with residency or even during residency, to kind of seek out these opportunities to see people who do more of it if they're not being taught and the person has an interest in doing it. Because, you know, just like anything else, if you're not exposed to it in training, you're more than likely not going to do it. But if that continues down this path, you know, eventually, you know, if, if the faculty at academic institutions are comfortable doing it, they're not going to do it. Certainly the people that they're teaching aren't going to do it. Um, but it's interesting, you know, Dr. Dome, you said, doc, hearing Dr. Moscow talk, you make some interesting points. Is this coming back? You look at the data on thermal neck fractures I talked about. I think it is. It's not going to go away completely. Uh, it'll be interesting. You know, maybe it's going to be a lot more prevalent in five years. The cycle swings right now. Look at hip arthroplasty. There's a lot of residency programs now. You know, or maybe all of the faculty are teaching anterior approach and all of a sudden posterior approach, which was the tried and true forever. Some people aren't even seeing a lot of that anymore. So it's, uh, it's kind of crazy how these go in cycle. Hey, um, uh, Dr. Tosh, maybe I can wrap us up with um, one uh, question uh, just about the field in general that's sort of pertinent to the American Hip Institute. Um, it, you've uh, grown up in a, a country where we tend to specialize uh, by procedure um, and we do a fellowship in reconstruction or we do a fellowship in uh, uh, sports medicine and arthroscopy um, and then you went to Exeter where they tend to specialize by the joint. Um, you, you got a hip surgeon or you got a, a knee surgeon. Um, so you, you've had a little bit of both. Um, uh, what's your perspective on those two ways of, of specializing? So 
I think that I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, I don't know how far down the road, 5, 10, 15 years down the road, if, if the U.S. maybe had even more of that. If you look at the trajectory it has been on, if you look you know, 20, 30 years ago, whatever it is, people didn't do a whole a lot of fellowships and now you know i think the data is like 95 or even 98 percent. i mean it's a massive percentage of residents do fellowships in something i i, I think that that's probably going to continue especially in big cities as, as people get more and more selective as the internet you know advertises you know this guy does this this and this you know we've joked before that people are eventually going to get down to doing less carpal tunnels only and that's what they're going to be really good at right like that's obviously a little extreme but in the arthroplasty world, I wouldn't be surprised. I have one partner who only does knees. He doesn't do hips anymore because he got busy enough doing knees and preferred it. Um, at, at my uh, at my fellowship, there's definitely guys that would do you know, 90% knees, 10% hips. Which at that point, you could argue why why would you do any hips? You know. So, uh, me me personally, I wouldn't be upset if I ended up doing only hips someday. I, I prefer hips. I you know I, I just kind of like them better for a lot of different reasons. So. I don't know. It's a good question. And I wouldn't be surprised if things drift in that direction, particularly in big markets. Well, listen, I, I sure do appreciate you joining us. And uh, I think all the fellows and faculty really enjoyed it as well. And um, uh, uh, thanks very much uh, for sharing this, this wonderful experience with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it.